This is the Doubles Only Tennis Podcast, where you learn the best tips and strategies in the world to help you become a smarter, more effective tennis player. You'll hear interviews with pro tour doubles players and coaches, including easy to use lessons to improve your game and win more matches. My name is Will Bocek, founder of the Tennis Tribe, doubles strategy coach, and host of the show. In this episode, I talk with six-time Grand Slam doubles champion Bruno Suarez. Now, if you don't know Bruno, he is one of the best doubles players of the last decade or so in the world. Uh, He won two men's Grand Slam doubles uh, titles back in 2016 with his partner, Jamie Murray. He won the 2020 U.S. Open with Mate Pavic, uh, and he also has three mixed doubles Grand Slams to his name. And at uh, age 40, he is still um, one of the the top players in the world and one of my favorite to watch. And in this conversation, uh, we cover a lot. Um, Bruno has a very very interesting perspective because he um, he's obviously a world-class player, but he seems to approach everything from a coach's mindset. So I feel like Uh, More than most player interviews, you'll learn a lot in this one. Uh, We cover um, why he's been able to have success at the U.S. Open. Uh, We cover his story. He um, he's from Brazil. He caught up with us uh, from his home down in Belo Horizonte. Uh, I ask him about his routines and his habits uh, the day before a big match, the day of a big match. Uh, What's his warm up routine? Um, I also ask him about practice, what does practice look like during a tournament versus in between tournaments versus the off season. And then we talk about strengths and weaknesses. Uh, his partner, Jamie Murray, uh, brother of Andy Murray, is left-handed. Uh, so we talk about playing with a left-handed uh, doubles partner. And we talk a lot about strategy um, when preparing for a match. Uh, does he play to his strengths or the opponent's weakness? Uh, how does he handle um, playing with a lefty. Uh, we talk about serve strategy, return strategy, uh, communication with your doubles partner. Do they do anything differently under pressure and a lot uh, more. So um, again, this is definitely one of my favorite uh, interviews I've done in a while. Um, so I think you'll really like this one. Uh, but without further delay, uh, please enjoy this conversation with Bruno Suarez. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today we have Six-time Grand Slam champion Bruno Suarez on. Bruno, welcome. Thank you very much, Will. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, we uh, met briefly at Indian Wells, and you were um, super nice. We chatted for several minutes there in the Indian Wells Tennis Garden, and uh, I was excited to talk to you and uh, and have you on the show. Um, and typically what I do uh, when I have somebody on is the first thing I'll do is I'll uh, type in Google and then type in your name and just see what yeah. comes up, see if there's been anything going on in the news. So I looked through, <laughs> I looked through several things, and um, I think the first question I want to ask you is, uh, how was the disco party this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> is that on Google? <laughs> really? Well, uh... it. L- it linked to your Instagram and you posted a picture okay. of you and some friends at a disco yeah. party. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing actually. It was a good friend of uh, of mine. Okay. He was getting married uh on the Saturday, but also his birthday was a couple of weeks ago, so he ended up doing a a whole weekend of partying and uh and the theme for for the Friday party which was his birthday was a disco party. So it was an intense weekend. That's all. That's all I can say. But uh, amazing. a lot of good stuff, good energy, good friends. Uh, it was very nice. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, the picture on Instagram looked uh, looked like you had a really uh, good costume, and it was a good time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all tennis players there, and uh, oh, really? Andres okay. Af, Andres Af, former tennis player from Brazil. Uh-huh. Uh, my coach is the one with the big wig, uh, mm-hmm. and also the guy getting married was a former player. He uh, played for Duke, Bruno Semenzato. So a lot of tennis history on this weekend. Nice tennis and disco. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um. So where uh where are you now? Where are you talking to us from? 
I'm back home in Belo Horizonte this weekend. The parties, they were in Sao Paulo, but I got back last night and okay. I'm back on my normal tennis routine here and working routine as well. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, we've got the U.S. Open coming up in about a month, maybe five weeks away. Uh, what are your plans between now and then? Do you have, um, are you going to play Canada and, and Cincinnati? Yeah. So, yes, playing uh, full summer is started in, in Washington, D.C. So this Thursday, okay. I'm on my way to, to Washington, mm-hmm. playing Washington, Canada, Cincinnati. Winston Saley is always a question mark, depending on results and how we're feeling. Mm-hmm. And then the U.S. Open. Uh, very excited. It's a great part of the year for me. Uh, I really enjoy hard court. I really enjoy the U.S. summer. Uh, yeah. I really enjoy those tournaments. It's a place that I've had a lot of success in the past. So, yeah, looking forward for the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at your results uh, for your career, and it looks like the U.S. Open, for some reason, has been kind of your most successful tournament. You've got uh, three men's Grand Slam doubles titles, three mixed, and two of those three on both sides were at the U.S. Open. And then you made the finals last year as well. Why do you think the U.S. Open has been so good uh, for you? Uh, I mean, I think this a little bit of everything uh, i mean first of all and most important is the conditions there mm-hmm. quite warm it's a medium fast hard court most of the time and i say most of the time because they resurface every year and some years it's lower yeah. fast than others but most of the time they usually medium fast uh a low bounce and humid place hot uh i li- i like these conditions it's probably my my best uh and other than that a lot of the atmosphere the vibe uh on the tournament mm-hmm. a lot of brazilians usually great crowds for us and yeah. the city my favorite city in the world uh, i love new york yeah. i love the madness of the city i'm a big city guy so i love being around there so i think it's just a, a good combination of everything like i said most important part it's how tennis is played but I think everything that goes off court and around that makes you feel good and brings good energy and good vibe towards everything that you do over there. So I think it's a good combination of all that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very fun tournament. Um, yeah. When I spent time in Brazil, it's, it's been like 10 years at this point, but I remember uh, every time I would tell someone I'm from the U.S., they everyone seems to love new york city they all say it's yeah. my favorite favorite city in the world favorite city in the world even yeah. more so more so than other uh, other countries i found um yeah. so i wanted to to go back a little bit so how did you get started in tennis what's kind of your story from uh from as a child getting into tennis and then um yeah. to where you are now? it's a little bit interesting because uh, I lived in Iraq from okay. uh, the first six years of my life. I was born in Brazil, in Belo Horizonte, my city that I am right now. Mm-hmm. And my dad, uh, he was a civil engineer at that time, uh, working for a big Brazilian group that got a, a job over there. And this company sent a lot of you know Brazilians to, to do this work. Mm -hmm. So my mom was pregnant, uh, so she waited uh, for me to to be born here in Brazil. And then we all moved. I mean, my dad was already there, but the the rest of the family, me, my brother, my sister, we moved to Iraq when I was two months. So I spent the first six years of my life in Iraq. So during this time, when I was around five, my parents, they played tennis for a very brief period of their time, but it was exactly the time that it was, you know, almost five. And I was, you know, going to the court to them and, and staying around, uh, you know, playing with the Rockets and watching them play and waiting there. Yeah. Uh, and at this time, we we're living in a camp. We we're living in a big city. So it was literally just a camp. So it's quite uh, small, very few people. So you're always around everyone. Uh, so I started kind of kick carrying the racket around, playing with the ball. And a couple months after that, we moved to Baghdad, which is the big city. And my parents 
uh, we had we had a tennis court in the complex that we lived, and they had a coach over there. So my parents, uh, I don't really remember if I asked or they put me into tennis. Yeah. So that's where I started, and from that point, I kind of fell in love with the game and never stopped. Uh, never had a break. Never got tired of it. So I was always progressing yeah. kept on you know everywhere we moved back from iraq to brazil and then moved a couple of cities in brazil but first thing for me was you know where i'm going to school and where i'm gonna be you know playing tennis so okay. tennis has been part of my life since i'm five i've moved everywhere because of my dad and then kind of moved mm-hmm. a lot because of tennis but this is how i started and yeah like i said i've never had a break of tennis since Age five was always part of my life. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I want to get into uh, some kind of off-court routines and habits. So, yeah, let's let's say um, let's say you're in the U.S. Open semifinal. So that's usually played on uh, Thursday, right? Yeah. So so let's say today's today's Wednesday. What would you be doing to prepare for your match t- for tomorrow? So what would you do for dinner what time are you going to bed uh things yeah. like that what are, what are kind of some of your routines so let's say my uh tournament routine is very different than my practice routine of course back home but tournament routine would be uh i mean let's put it before semifinal like you asked i think yeah. before semifinals i already played a lot of matches uh, a lot of tennis, so I mean, I know exactly what's going on, how I'm feeling, uh, you know, how the court is played, the opponents, how we mm-hmm. play, everything. So I would say the day before, it's really how I'm feeling physically. I mean, if we played a lot of three sets, if I'm playing, you know, men's and mix. Uh, mm-hmm. So my my practice would, you know, kind of go around that. But I would say on average, I would be one hour in the court and one hour in the gym. Uh, okay. and then, you know, the in- intensity of that would just, you know, vary accordingly with, with how I'm feeling, you know, physically, Sure, it's not a, it's not a day that you really have to put in a lot of work because, you know, the work is there. So for me, way more important to be physically and mentally ready than, you know, working a lot on something that, you know, I already know how, how it's been playing routine, yeah. very similar to every day in terms of what i eat i'm a big sushi guy so most likely okay. i'll get my sushi at night uh I'm, I'm i'm brazilian we don't have early dinners so i'd say my dinner would be around 8 39 until you know 10 10 something mm-hmm. go back to the hotel eat, eat, chill a little bit i usually go to bed can't really sleep early so i would say I'll go to bed in between you know 11 30 12 uh, mm-hmm. and then depends on, on, on the time of the match, uh, what I'm going to do in the morning or practice or anything, but the day before w- would be, you know, yeah. and every, every off day would be something like this. I would say in the beginning, you practice more because you get a, you know, you want to get used to the conditions and everything. Yeah. And then as the tournament progress, you kind of adjust to how you feel in and how much tennis you played in the last couple of days. Okay. And, and for that off day practice, are you... Um, it's only an hour. Are you working on specific things that you know you'll need to use against an opponent the next day? Like, yeah. Most okay. most likely, you know, 70% of this practice will be specifics. Oh, so okay. what I would do is, you know, hit to the basics for a good 20, 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the rest would be kind of working on, okay, am I playing a lefty? Am I playing a big server? Am I, mm-hmm. you know you know, returning more down the line. Uh, this guy's doing a lot of plays. Do I have to work on my reading? Uh, okay. You know, they're very solid from the back. We, we're playing two base, base liners, so a lot of volley, a lot of first volleys. Yeah. So most of that, because most of the time I will know my opponent already, mm-hmm. uh, especially before semifinals, I'll probably know my opponent already. So I'm working on how to play. Like I said, if I'm in the semifinals, it's because yeah. I'm playing good tennis. I'm doing something right. So for me, it's more important to work on these specifics, on the stuff that I will have to be very sure. good next day to to beat my opponent. And of course, preparing preparing for the match. You know, if if have a day, why would you wait the day of the match to start thinking about the opponents and what you gotta do and how you play these guys? So yeah. there's usually a lot of talk 
involved with Jamie and the coaches and, you know, who are the guys, what are they doing well? You have a lot of information already because these guys also played four matches already. So you, you've watched a lot of them. So you know mm-hmm. you know what to do. So it's pretty much put it in the work to, you know, prepare uh, for, for this specific match. Yeah. Are, are you looking at, um, let's say you play a team like, um, uh, like Mektic and Pavic, for example, a team you've played several times, they've been around, you know a lot about them. How, how much yeah. weight are, are you putting on your own experience playing against them versus what have they been doing in this tournament specifically? I would say, I would say, would go 50 50 pretty much. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think it carries a lot of weight uh history uh Mm -hmm. so how many times we play them how do they play against us have Mm -hmm. they always played this way because they're successful do we feel that they're going to change because we've been beating them more than than losing uh and then the Mm -hmm. rest is how are they playing this tournament because i would say it will vary you know yeah they might do something different on clay they didn't do on hard they didn't do on grass so where we play them also really matters so it'd be a combination of both because okay, I've played them four times at the U.S. Open. So I have a lot of records at the U.S. Open. But no, I've played yeah. them four times, but two on clay, two on grass. First time I'm going to play on hard court at the U.S. Open. Okay, makes it makes a difference. Yeah. Might not be a big difference, but it makes a difference. So yeah. very important to watch how they're playing, what they're doing, you know, what's been working for them. How can we neutralize that? Okay, and then, I mean, you got data from here, data from here. You got to cross cross data and see okay he's been you know Mate is a lefty he's been working on his wide serve and that works really well against me didn't couldn't really do anything so he's been doing that as well okay how can I try something different tomorrow to avoid you know getting caught on his wide serve all the time or you know kind of making him think different so I would say it's 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 50 50 okay yeah that makes sense yeah are you watching a lot of film on the, yes, the I matches was, you do. Yeah, that 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 made my life a lot easier. The videos <sighs> because back in the days when I was playing with Alex Bea, we're literally we're very. Uh, I'm I'm very I'm a stat guy, so I'm I'm uh, I'm visual, uh, and I like to. I think one of my strengths is being able to adapt and kind of have different game styles if I have to. Uh-huh. Uh, so for me knowing what the opponent's doing and how they're playing and what they're struggling with, it's a big part of my game because I feel like I can adapt to that and kind of be annoying and effective on, on my on my strategy. So, you know, when I was playing with Alex Peya, we were literally watching three, four matches a day or every match that every double mm-hmm. they had a day, at least the set, to have our own data, you know, taking notes and, you know, doing now. We have a yeah. video, so it's easier. You know, yeah. I'm sitting in my hotel room, I'm just watching you know every point and 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 it's 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 easier but i'm a big video stat guy i think makes a huge difference and if you know how to work with that it's it's very very important very useful in your game because you know we all have patterns we all play you know Mm -hmm. different under pressure you know we we all have a favorite shot a favorite serve something that we feel more confident with so if you know those patterns from, you know, most of the players, you can really work around that and kind of, you know, work on getting into their head, at least by, you know, knowing that, you know, making them aware that you know what are their routines and then, you know, favorite shots and, you know, comfort zone or the, the stuff that they will do under pressure. So for me, it was always a big part of my my game. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff is super powerful. Yeah. I work with it a lot as well and love to be able to know where uh, teams like to serve on pressure points so that I can kind of either, either be ready for it or start to move that direction before they get into their motion. So then they, they kind of see me and you can really kind of play with their mind a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a mind game. So if you you know can get in there, it's very, very useful. Yeah. So, so what about a uh, day of the match routines? Do you have any, um, any particular like warm up routine or anything that you like to do uh, on a 
No, basis? I mean, Something I mean, not, not no. Yes, I have, I have yeah. my own routine. But no, I usually, I mean, I'll start my day with with my physio. So doing mm-hmm. my normal physio routine in the morning, kind of get the body ready. You know, you always wake up feeling different. Back's a little bit more stiff. So okay, get the mm-hmm. body going. Uh, a little bit of gym to to start. Usually, you know, twenty five minutes, half an hour. Uh, in the gym, doing a little bit of everything. So pretty much good stretch, uh, something that I've done with the physio, but active stretches, abs, you know, working a little bit of shoulder mobility and stuff. Mm-hmm. And and then going to the court, normal warm up. you know, usually 30 minutes. That's what we get. If we mm-hmm. have the chance, me and Jamie usually go a little bit more, but usually, you know, on, on tournaments, they give us half an hour. So we kind of have to, you know, and do the whole warm up in and, and then yeah. it's 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 quite basic you know warm up you know baseline volleys reactions serve return and 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 we're ready most of the time we already talked about the match the day before with our coaches so that mm-hmm. date's pretty much you know the last couple of thoughts and and then you know rest and wait for the match uh they usually you know I'm I'm with my friends coach or Jamie or you know before the match and then you know 45 minutes before I'll go kind of to my side and 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 relax be on my own just to kind of get the mind clear and uh yeah. and then you know 15 minutes before I'll hit to the gym again and you know just get the body ready to to start the match got it okay and it, what is um you talked about practice during a tournament what what does practice look like for you right now like when you're between tournaments uh, i'm sure you're on the court a, a little bit more than an hour um so, yeah, so what, is it, I mean, what does a typical if, practice look like i think for me i mean now i'm I'm 40 uh and honestly the last 18 months been quite tough on my body yeah. I've, uh, I've always been very fortunate with that very few injuries uh on my career very mm-hmm. little pain usually you know uh like strong pain you have pain every day but like strong pain that limits you to do something Mm -hmm. so it's been quite tough for me the last 18 months so i've been spending a lot of time in the physio room uh, the last the last (laughs) year and a half which is not nice uh because it takes takes a lot of hours on the court so let's put it on a healthy day uh on a health healthy swing yeah uh, off tournament back back home I would go uh, a lot of fitness and tennis would be progressive depending on how many days uh, I have uh, to my traveling. So Mm -hmm. I start, uh, let's put it, if I have 10 days, a block of 10 practice days, I'll do a lot of gym and little tennis and this will go like this Uh, until until the day of my first match. Got so it. usually when I'm back in Belo, uh, for example, I'm going to Washington and I will arrive on Friday. So I would have at least three days practice there, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, if I play Monday. So, you know, my those three days I'll practice a lot of tennis and very few uh, fitness because, you know, the seven days prior to that, I'm doing a lot of fitness and tennis mm-hmm. would be progressive. So I would say, you know, for the first you know, three days, I would go probably an hour and a half uh, of tennis only. Uh, two hours as it progresses. And then most like the, the two days uh, that I get there, I would go twice a day. Uh, and then mm-hmm. on Sunday, it kind of going to depend. If I play Monday, I'll take it easy. If I know that I'm not going to play Monday, I'll have another, another uh, twice, a the, uh, twice a day probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, tough to say in DC because it's extremely hot. So sometimes it's tough to do the second yeah. one. But on a, on yeah. on a normal, not extreme condition, would would be something that. And then the day before is the day that you take it easy. You know, okay. you go one hour only, and then you rest. You rest for the match. So my preparation was always like this. I always enjoyed, and I felt for me that uh, fitness was very important to go really really strong when I'm back home. So yeah. I would say I would go twice a day every day until I travel. Uh, yeah. And then you know tennis will progress and go up as as the tournament approaches. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, different than preseason, 
when it's a lot of hours for a long period of time. So, you know, okay. we're talking about three weeks of practicing, you know, two and a half, three hours a day, but this is preseason. And then during yeah. the season on off tournaments would be progressive. Okay. And, and how, how much of that on-court time is spent doing drills versus playing a match versus working on serves and returns? Like how does it uh, kind of divide up? Yeah, in Bello, in Bello, it's a hundred percent specifics. Uh, okay. Never, never play matches here. Never. Uh, okay. I don't know. Don't <laughs> don't feel the need. I play a lot of tennis when I'm in tournaments. Yeah. So I feel like for me, when I'm here, it's really about, especially because Jamie is also not here. Uh, for me, it's really the time that I have to work on the stuff that I have to improve yeah. as an individual. And okay. then when I'm together with Jamie, though, that's the time that I have to, you know, improve as a team as well. So what are the stuff that we can do better? And when I'm back here, it's what is the stuff that I can do better, that I need to do better. So work on, you know, wide serve and first volley down the line, work on my no, my, my net play when Jamie returned, when Jamie's serving, mm-hmm. uh, my position. And this is, so I would go a lot of specific. Uh, and I also do, uh, I, I like to do a lot of volume mm-hmm. uh, because when I go to tournaments, uh, we do a lot of specifics and points. So when I'm here, I like to do a lot of volume. So usually okay. a good, you know, 20 minutes of my practice would be almost like a singles practice. Yeah. Okay. And how are you deciding what which specific thing to work on? Or is it like my return was bad in that last tournament, so I'm going to work on that? Or is it I'm looking at data and I'm losing a lot of points when I have a backhand return or or something else? Both. Yeah. Both. I think I think there's the there's the overall routine, and I do this every day. Yeah. That regardless if I'm doing good or bad, I, I have to do this. So return, serve, first of all, you know, the uh-huh. reactions. This, I got to do it. And then I'll go into things that I'm not doing well. Uh, and I work on that. And then I go on things that I might actually be doing well, but I'm not winning a lot of points. And I want to understand why. So sometimes, mm. uh, okay, I'm doing really well. I'm very good on my returns, Okay. I'm, you know, making 65% of first serve returns, which is amazing, but I'm only winning 20% of the points. And why? why? If I'm getting the ball in play 65% of the time, why am I only winning, you know, 20% of the time? Uh, okay, it's my fault because my back, my, I'm missing a lot of second balls because I'm waiting for Jamie to touch the, the, the ball and, I, and I'm forgetting to move, you know, my feet myself and be ready for a second ball if okay. I have to play. I'm returning and standing in the, in the wrong position i'm you know whatever it is so i will work on that as well so i think it's it's a combination of of both sometimes it'd be just poor returning i gotta improve my return and i'm not giving yeah. you know jamie the chance of you know be effective and uh, and do his thing and sometimes mm-hmm. i'm just not being good enough on the next ball and i you know i gotta work on that as well got it that makes sense um so i, I want to talk a little um kind of strengths and weaknesses. So let's start with uh, Jamie. What what would you say is Jamie's biggest strength as a doubles player? Uh, net play. Uh, mm-hmm. I think I think nowadays, uh, because the game of doubles changed quite a bit, I think he's got mm-hmm. the best ball in the world by far. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's an amazing net player uh i think we got different types of net players i think guys with amazing volleys that produces you know very good first volleys but are not very good at the world not very good at reactions you mm-hmm. know they're very good uh I, I call that singles uh volleyer that the guy yeah. that has a great volley you know playing to the other side making the guy run and finish on the on the on the second volley mm-hmm. in doubles you know so many times you got to produce you know, an amazing first volley and, you know, be ready at the wall because you're not going to win the point with a winner uh, because the court is, you know, yeah. it's, it's smaller when you have yeah. two guys uh, covering that. So I think Jamie Jamie's net play is, is, is the best in the game right now. Mm-hmm. The volley, His volley is uh, definitely the best, but he also, he reads the game when he's at the net really mm-hmm. well. So he puts a lot of pressure 
and he creates a lot of stress uh, in the opponents uh, with that, which, I mean, for me, it combines really well with my strength. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it, he does such a good job of creating just tiny windows for the other yeah. team, it seems like. Um, exactly. One, one so, small mistake he'll make you pay. Yeah, he's he's a guy that he so many times he wins the point by just moving to the right position, you know, creating stress. And mm-hmm. you know, this is a big part of the game, and you know, big part of playing doubles is knowing how to move when you're not with the ball. So yeah, way less, way less than in singles. In singles, got you know anticipation. There's a lot of stuff, but I think in doubles, way more. Because you can create way more stress in doubles. What do you think uh, is his biggest weakness as a doubles player? I think his biggest weakness uh, over time was his returns. Uh, okay. It's something that he put a lot of hours uh, into that. I think the biggest change in his career was understanding his uh, way of returning. I think mm-hmm. for a long time he tried to be an aggressive returner and hit the ball. And, you know, the moment he understood and accepted that that wasn't his thing, like he wasn't yeah. that kind of returner. Uh, and he started working on variety and, you know, his, his forehand return with the chip lob and the chip cross court, he became very effective with that. Uh, right. I think that was his biggest weakness. Now, I don't think it's a weakness. Uh, it's something that he, build that into being either you know solid or even a strength yeah yeah that's something um for people listening if you're struggling or turning that's a really good point because yeah yeah he, he did um you know if you're struggling like taking you know regular kind of big cuts at the return one thing that yeah. he does so well is is he uh he steps forward and takes away time from the net player yeah. so even though he's returning yeah. it slowly with that chip, the net player doesn't have any yeah. time because he's so yeah. far forward in the court. Yeah, uh, and then the lob returns he, he cre- great. He, yeah, he creates stress also because they know most of the time he will come in behind the return. Right. So you got to produce ball. something decent with the volleys, otherwise he just you know he's on top of that, and so that that also creates stress when you're serving any when you come in for for the first volley. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that's you know part of understanding your game style and and, and knowing how to how to work with that. I, I mean, another big part of I think his the mental part of his game. He improved a lot. I think he was mm-hmm. when I first first started playing against him. He wasn't even my partner. Played a, a long time against him yeah. before he's being on the same side as me. Uh, he was way more stressed. I think over the years he learned to be more composed and that you know it was very good for him yeah what uh what about yourself what are your biggest uh what's your biggest strength and biggest weakness as a doubles player i think i think my biggest strength it's my ability to adapt and be consistent uh i think my biggest weakness is not having anything extremely powerful, which is good that I don't have anything weak mm-hmm. that I consider a, a weakness. Yeah. But I think other than my returns that are above average, I think I'm an average guy on every category, which it's very good when you know how to use that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm a guy that in doubles, I also need need a, a good partner that works with me. I'm not that guy that will win the match by mm-hmm. myself. So I think my biggest strength with that, I, the ability to adapt to different players and be very consistent. I feel like I play on a on a on a high level on you know every surface condition and, and partner. But my biggest weakness is is not having anything major, you know, that yeah. I can rely on and say, listen, if this shot is going in i'm gonna win this match i don't have that so i have to work a lot with stats and strategy and being smart on the court interesting yeah so there's nothing for people to really exploit but um yeah yeah yeah, but also yeah i i also don't have anything that they're gonna see so whoa we really have to avoid that the only thing that so many times i can 
make a huge difference, but they can't avoid it is my return because they have to serve to me. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think also, I mean, the my mental part, I think was always a, a, a strength. I was always sure. very, you know, composed, calm. I think I bring uh, kind of balance to the team on, you know, my partner's looking at me and seeing that I'm, I'm, I'm quite steady with that. And, and, you know, I keep my, my ground under pressure. I think I'm, I'm a guy that plays well under pressure. And so mm -hmm. I think the mental part of the game was always, you know, a, a good uh, strength of mine. Yeah. Yeah. I think I agree. I, when I've, when I've watched you play in person, uh, probably more than any other player, I feel like you're very like Zen on the court and you're very yeah. like kind of even keel and, uh, yeah, I, I don't yeah, know. but this is yeah, it, but this is it's some it was something that I've learned with time, and mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it, it had a huge impact on my game because I was I was more agitated in the past, and I mm. with time I realized that everything that it took me of my Zen mode, mm -hmm. uh, either up or down, I was not playing good. I couldn't be too high uh too pumped to you know uh, excited because yeah. i wasn't playing my best and every day that was complaining too much also i was completely out of the thing so yeah. that worked but it goes it was good because it goes well with my personality i'm a very you know calm laid back guy off court so it's basically translating you know my personality into the court and learning you know how to play with that so you know, for the last 10, 12 years on tour, I was really able to kind of understand that and be very calm and, and understand, listen, okay, no need to panic now. Let's work, yeah. let's keep that because, you know, this is going to be beneficial for you and, and for you to play your best tennis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about strategy. Um, this next question, I I, th I think you've kind of already answered, but I'll ask it anyways. Um, so so when you're preparing for a match, uh, the question is, do you play to your strengths or the opponent's weakness? And it, it seems like you play to the opponent's weakness a little more. Yeah, right? I I yes, my I think my strength yeah is to be able to play to the opponent's weakness. So yeah. this is my strength. So if I have to answer that, it would be outplay more to the opponent's uh, weakness. What about Unless, as a team with you and as, Jamie? I, I think so. Jamie uh, Jamie is a very smart guy uh, seeing that. Mm -hmm. He's very good or with his eyes on, you know, watching a player and identifying, you know, his the stuff that he struggles, some patterns on how he moves and, yeah. So Jamie is very good on translating that into us. And I feel that I'm good on executing. So Jamie feels like the guy does, you know, something not very good. I think I'm mm -hmm. good at translating that to my game and say, okay, so let's, let's yeah. go there because I'm kind of flexible with that. Okay. We have to return down the line, you know, 70% of the time. Okay. I can do that. I can adapt that. I, yeah. you know, we, got to open the line more we got so i can adapt and i think jamie is very good for me because he's got a great eye for that mm -hmm. um so, so you've had a lot of success with jamie you won the us open with uh Pavic as well um and they are both left-handed yeah. uh, so talk a little bit about playing with a left-handed player and i feel like a lot of the top especially on the men's side, a lot of the top doubles yeah. teams, I mean, the, the Brian brothers, you have a lefty, uh, yeah. Zabios, yeah. Zabios yeah. is left-handed. Yeah. So talk a little bit about playing with a, a left-handed player. Yeah. I, I really like this combination. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, to be honest, I when when I stopped with Jamie and started playing with Mate, it wasn't because of his lefty. It was kind of just a coincidence. Mate is, it's, yeah. it's an amazing player. Of course, being lefty helps his game style and everything. But I asked Mate to play because he was just a pure amazing player. Okay, and lefty was a was a bonus as well. Sure. But I really like this combination. I think you give 
uh, a different angle on everything that you do uh, mm-hmm. for the opponents. So that it, it makes life tougher. You always kind of adjusting something. So mm-hmm. you're never really playing the same thing, you know, when you have two righties or two lefties. Oh, so for me, I think it's 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 a great combination. And also, I think when you have a right lefty combo, it's a little bit easier to protect your weakness mm-hmm. as a team. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and with with uh, Mate, you did you return on the ad side there as well? Yeah, the yeah, ad okay. side as well. Mate, Mate prefers the deuce. Yeah, uh, but I mean, it's it's funny because two lefties, but completely different game style. Yeah, uh, Mate is way more aggressive uh, than Jamie. Jamie's way more uh, the strategy player. Mate is a, it's, I mean, Mate is a very powerful player. So mm-hmm. Mate is a guy that you know he he's got to focus on his game because when his game is on, he wins the match on his own. It doesn't right. matter what the opponents are doing. So he's got an amazing serve, aggressive returns. You know, he's a young, fast, athletic guy. So yeah. very different on how to play with Mate and how to play with Jamie. But, you know, great mm-hmm. to have lefties on my side. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with uh, with serving, so earlier I was watching, uh, I, I have some film on uh, a bunch of doubles matches and I looked up some film that I had on y'all's matches and I rewatched a lot of the U.S. Open final last year. And I think you serve served and stayed back two, maybe three times in the whole match. Yeah. They yeah. were both they were both uh second serves and they were both in the deuce court to um to Joe Salisbury. Yeah. And both times um Jamie was moving right. So yeah. how do you think about deciding? It seems like it's rare for you anyways, but how do you think about deciding when to serve in volley versus serve and stay back? Yeah. So for me, I mean, the history of my serve is it's it's crazy. I've changed my serve, my serve so many times of my career. It's small adjustment, probably not yeah. even uh, the, uh, the normal person can even tell that I changed my serve, but me mm-hmm. and my coach always trying to improve something. I don't have an amazing serve. I think I have a decent serve, but it's not amazing. So I constantly try to improve, you know, an extra one, two percent that could help me on serving sure. better. And I think with time, depending on, you know, the adjustment that I had on my serve, uh, because I don't use my legs at all, as you probably know, uh, yeah. on my serve, I serve a lot of my arm and just, you know, upper body. Uh, different positions on 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 uh, not positions directions to run i feel like i am really slow on getting there uh so it's easier for me to wait back instead of playing a very very difficult first volley i prefer to kind of hit the first one and try to come in or hit the first one and maybe have to you know to 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 rally from the back and I, I feel confident that I can do that as well if I need. So eventually, sometimes some positions, I will do some serve and stay back mainly mm-hmm. because of that. I feel like I would be in a bad position on my first volley on and 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 as a team if I have to to play that that ball. And if some something that I feel it's the best play for that moment, I feel confident enough that I can hit a couple of balls from the back. Got it. Okay. And, uh, but it, it's it's more it's more a combination of my serve and my movement after the serve not being good, yeah, uh, on certain directions. Uh, okay, Jamie, for example, his you know Joe Salisbury, it's a guy that he's he's insane. You know, his first ball yeah, is uh, of bad. course he's very young. Uh, yeah, guys, is so yeah. athletic, so his first ball is always so close to the net. Yeah. I've never had that, so for me, I kind of have to work around and. You know, a strategy to to kind right. of you know cover cover a weakness that I have. Yeah. Well. Well. I mean, both of those were both of the ones I saw were second serves. They were to the yeah. deuce court, and Jamie was moving right, so you're covering the line. Yeah. So to serve and volley on that, hitting a second serve to Joe is like it's probably a tough serve and volley, anyways. Um, so that makes yeah, a lot of sense. Yeah. And also, I'm I'm on the second serve because the way I toss, I'm not good running there. 
So mm. I usually fall too much this way. So uh, I, I lose okay. a lot of time. So it's almost better for me to just keep on going <laughs> to the yeah, baseline yeah. You know, and hit a more normal shot. Got it. Okay. Um, so also um, with regard to serving, so talk a little about communication. Um, when you're about to serve, what are you telling Jamie? You're telling him, I assume, location, eye, irregular, direction. Um, talk a little yeah. bit about, about what you all discuss before serving. Everything. Uh, yeah, I think most of the time the server will call the play on how he's feeling and what he thinks. Mm-hmm. Me and Jamie, quite quite a bit, we kind of ask uh, each other on, sometimes I'm serving and I'm like, okay, w- w- what do you think? What do you feel? I mean, because are you seeing something that I maybe didn't notice? Because mm-hmm. so many times I feel like, you know, you were at the net and I'm just looking at the guy and the guy's like, he's covering T a lot. So, okay, Jamie, the guy's moving T, he's cheating a little bit. Let's try to, you know, to kind yeah. of catch him on a wide serve, on a body forehand that he's moving that direction and he's going to get caught. Yeah. So, but most of the time it's, it's how I'm feeling. Okay, you know, I want to serve T, I want to play I, go back. I want to, you know, if I have to play my first volley, I want to play four, for, you know, with my forehand and cross court. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, and then I, I feel like don't really know the other teams because it's 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 them but me and jamie we mm-hmm. talk quite often on that jamie would ask uh you know jamie because he's a lefty and he works a lot with uh with reserve like he lost like the three quarters who using using the lefty mm-hmm. he asks a lot is, is this guy cheating he like is he moving is he you know so uh i, I would say yeah yeah like he's he's scoring two way more okay let's let's try kick wide make him you know hesitate a little bit but yeah. that's that's what we talk pretty much strategy doubles extremely important to anticipate and you know the only shot that you know uh where it's going to be it's when you're serving the rest it depends on reaction and where the opponent's going to play the ball so you can't really anticipate right. that you got to be always in neutral position neutral position ready to react mm-hmm. and when you know you know when when a guy's serving and where he's playing the ball it's that's the time yeah. you have to be in the right place and anticipate a shot. Do you talk about, um, like, let's say you're serving in the deuce court and you say, all right, I'm going to serve T here and you uh, will do I formation and you get right. Uh, do you tell them if you're going to hit, like, it's going to be a flat serve down the T yeah. or I'm going to yeah, slide yeah, it or, okay. So you'll talk about yeah, this spin a little bit yeah, as well. I, mean, I would say, like, Jamie hits three quarters 90% of the time. Mm-hmm. And I hit flat 80% of the time. Okay. So if I'm going to do something different, I tell him. I'll go T-serve kick. If mm-hmm. I only say T-serve, he knows it's usually my flat T-serve. If uh, Jamie okay. says T-serve, uh, I know it's his, you know, the cutter, the, the lefty cutter. Uh, okay. If he goes bomb, he will say, I'm going fast here. I say, okay, so I know uh, it's not going to have a lot of, uh, you know, side action but it, it's going to come faster uh yeah. jamie also jamie has more variety on the serve than i do so he will mm-hmm. say more for example mm-hmm. on the deuce he goes a, a lot with the kick and a lot mm-hmm. of the slice so he would say you know kick yeah uh so i know you know the ball is going to be you know the serve is going to be slower but it's going to have more action towards the outside and you know i have to wait a little bit on on how to move not to give the guy a clue to what i'm doing but i think right. it's important to know because it makes it makes a difference yeah so on how early you're going to move and where you're going to go and also the way the guy's going to hit the ball you know the guy's going to hit a fast one flat or with sure. a lot of spin up high that he's going to have to control a bit more the way the angle is going to come so i think everything counts and every information that you can have helps you on your decision making and being on the right the the, yeah. the right place yeah yeah that's super important it's um yeah that's something i've like changed about my own game the last few years like i'll typically um just because i don't get to play as much tennis anymore i uh I'll usually call more poaches on a more spinny serve because if if they hit it flat, the return is going to come back with such pace, and I, I yeah. can't always handle those volleys as well. Um, yeah. So I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll communicate that a lot more with my partner. 
Yeah. I think also, yeah, that really goes with your point. So, for example, uh, Jamie, he's very good on creating stress when he's up there. So mm -hmm. a lot of the times I play regular just because I know if I hit a good serve, Jamie, there's a good chance he will touch the ball. And yeah. if he doesn't touch, I have to worry on that specific part of the court. And mm -hmm. even if it comes fast, I know where I have to be and what I have to play. Yeah. And some guys like me and Alex, uh, we were a lot of, you know, just creating different, you know, plays to give the guys. Uh, we always playing different. So mm. that was a big strength of me and Alex. We could play almost every game style because Alex was a guy that was very solid as well from, from uh, everywhere in the court. So I think it, it. also on that. So, for example, on the ad side, I always played a lot of eye with Alex. Mm -hmm. And when I started playing with Jamie, I played a lot of regular because, I mean, Jamie's lefty. He's got such a big reach. So yeah. literally, when I made a good serve, the guy had so few, I mean, the, the very yeah. small space to get right. the ball past Jamie because the rest of the guy was touching. So it's either the guy creating something amazing or Jamie was 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 touching the ball. So mm. uh, it, it really depends on on who's your partner as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what about returns? How, how do you think about returning? Uh, a lot of guys are serving and staying back, and I know you play a lot of uh, against a lot of singles players who will play in the doubles draw as well. Um, how do you think about returning against somebody who serves and stays back versus someone who serves in volleys? Okay, so I think for me, I'm a consistent returner. Uh, I think the adjustment that I will do when the guy serves and stays back, mm -hmm. I will be a little bit more aggressive because I feel like I have to make uh, a little bit more. Otherwise, if I just kind of make him play and he's got time to adjust and hit a big one uh, on his first shot, we are in trouble. It's tough for Jamie to put pressure and he, he can have a, he can, he can hit a heavy shot. If I'm playing mm -hmm. someone that serves in volley, I feel like, okay, I got to make this guy play a low first volley and then Jamie will create uh, a, a lot of stress and put a lot of, a lot of pressure. If okay. I don't do that against someone that's serving and stay back and the guy's able to, I mean, these guys from the back, they're so good and they hit the ball yeah. so hard that yeah. you got to create something more. Uh, mm. But also, you know, I know that usually his net player, it's also not a doubles guy. So he's not putting a lot of stress on me as well. So I sure. know what I have to do. So pretty much, you know, I'm going to have to make my cross, my, my, you know, cross court return with a little more pace and then work on that. Uh, doubles teams, you know, they do a lot of plays, so I gotta be ready with my eye on what to put to, to see movement. So mm -hmm. different stress and just different way of returning. On I guess singles guys, most of the time, I'm just worrying about returning how to hit the ball, not mm -hmm. about movement. Uh, but also against singles guys and guys that serve and stay back, we want to create stress at the net player if we feel that he's uncomfortable there being the yeah. target. So those are the two adjustments that you know i might i might do okay what about the lob return how do you uh decide to incorporate that or is there teams you use it against uh, more or for me it's pretty much inexistent uh, i don't <laughs> have this return it's not uh, part I, saw, of my I saw game. you hit i saw you hit one i think in, in the u.s open final yeah it's probably the only one i hit in, <laughs> yeah 2021 so okay <laughs> I hit two lobs a year, uh, unless it's a it's a reaction or or, or a stretch. Okay. But if I have it here, uh, I will hit the ball. So I trust my return. I take I take it early. I have short swing, so for me difficult, and I don't really have this a, a good feel on on the lob return. Yeah. So I'll just leave that. I'll, I'll leave everything for Jamie. He's the <laughs> okay. he's the king of that. <laughs> well, I, we'll have him on the show next time and ask him about that. Yeah. <laughs> um. Is there anything that uh, y'all do differently in tiebreakers? Do you try to talk a little more or do you change your strategy? Anything that, that changes? Uh, I think for me, one thing I'll do different, 
in tie breaks is I think when you're playing a normal game, especially in the Grand Slams with Ed, mm -hmm. you have room to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on the tie break, that one point that you lose in a serve, it could cost you the breaker. Sure. So I will play my most consistent and effective play that day. That's mm -hmm. usually my adjustment. So I wouldn't go, I mean, during a game, I can maybe start being super aggressive. The first two points, I'll go for a bomb, serve, yeah. and you know, an ace. And then all of a sudden, okay, didn't really work. I played two second serves. It's lost 30. Okay, time to go percentage and make up a serve and try to get back. I yeah. mean, if I start a break like this and all of a sudden I lose two points, it might be over, you know, we're down, right. you know, 7-2. So this is probably my adjustment. If that day my bomb serve is on, you know, 75% and I'm winning 95% of the points, I will yeah. go bomb. But yeah. if that's not the case, I will go with my, you know, most successful play that day. I think mm -hmm. that's the adjustment that I will go. I think this is more for me. I think Jamie is a very uh, percentage player uh, throughout the match. So he does a lot of plays with percentage. So he he tends to keep his, his same... Uh, uh, same pattern, I would say, during the breaker. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So it seems like a, a little bit. Don't take quite as many unnecessary risks. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a guy yeah. that I, I've always took a lot of risk when I'm serving on a game, mm -hmm. because I always felt that okay, if it's going in, I'm I'm winning fast and you know getting yeah. that done, and it's not really going in. I can adjust and still have time to get to back in the back. game. Okay. Yeah. And and I take the risk of losing my serve because of that here and there, but I prefer yeah. to play this way. Uh, yeah. So I'm the guy that in breakers, I have to adjust that if it's not really working, taking a lot of risk. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay. Last two questions. And then I want to ask a few kind of rapid fire questions. Um, is there a player or team on tour that you feel like for whatever reason you just match up really well against? And every time you see them in the draw and you're about to play them, you're like, I feel good, good about this matchup. I think th there is. I mean, don't, don't have anyone here in, 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 in my head, but there is both ways. Yeah. Uh, there's a guy, guys, some guys who just for some reason, uh, they're just a nightmare and he, there's no really explanation for that, but he yeah. just feels like he reads you all the time and gets you and plays uh -huh. better and, and vice versa. And I think this is a huge part of the sport that people don't really pay attention on and see how big is that is matchups because mm -hmm. literally I'm playing the semifinals of a grand slam and there's a guy that I hate to play and there's a guy that I love to play, but when they play 50-50, so basically, you know, I'm I'm my 80% favorite against this guy and my 80% underdog against the other team. And that plays a big part of winning a slam or, you know, winning a big tournament. Sure. But yes, there, there, there always is, uh, you know, both ways, guys, that for some reason it's just a nightmare one way or the other. Yeah. You, you can't share any names that uh, that maybe you struggle against? Oh, I str I struggle against. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm gonna say. I mean, it's easy to say the Nestor, the Brian, <laughs> yeah. but it's not because of the game style. It's just because they are, you know, because yeah, everybody and, struggles against them. <laughs> exactly, everybody struggles yeah. against them. But yeah, Lodra, I could never beat the guy. Uh, <laughs> always got me. Yeah. Uh, Well, I have to think on that. I'll come back it's, to you. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. That's, that, that's enough. Um, yeah. All right. So, so let's dive into these rapid fires. Uh, what is your favorite tennis book? Favorite tennis book? I don't think I ever read a tennis book. I don't remember. Really? I'm not. I'm not a book guy. Wow. I like short information. So uh -huh. I'm more like of a video talk or reading an article or something like this. So, okay. Got it. Okay. Uh, do you have a favorite non-tennis book? Non-tennis book. I'm, I'm not a book guy. Let's say Let's go fa to movies and favorite favorite movie. <laughs> favorite movie. 
I mean, favorite movie, I would say, overall, would be The Usual Suspects. I okay, think this yeah. is my favorite movie. But there's a lot of movies on that category yeah. that I really like. But if I have to say one, I would say that's the movie that it kind of caught me more. Yeah, yeah, good choice. What's your favorite uh, tournament? Favorite tournament would be U.S. Open. Mm. Um, what is your favorite tennis story? I think my my uh, my favorite tennis story being me the the person in the story or any story tennis story. Either one. I mean, I think for me, my favorite tennis story is, uh, you know, getting in as an alternate French Open and reaching the semifinals and almost winning the tournament. Uh, I think this is number one. I mean, winning slams and stuff, a little bit different, of course, in the emotions, but yeah. I think that was a crazy moment and a big change on my tennis career. Uh, I think my favorite tennis moment would be 97 uh google winning the french open uh mm -hmm. because of a lot of things uh for what the way he he did it for that time the way you know we're consuming the sport and watching on tv and the way the information was getting back and you know listen to that you know the, this, that guy i remember him he used to play he's, he's in paris french open third round yeah and everything that kind of happened uh on those two weeks and also after that so i think my favorite tennis moment would be that guga 97 french open win yeah so uh last question how can we make pro doubles more popular i think uh exposure i think this is this is number one uh mm -hmm. it's got to be on TV, people's got to be able to watch that and you got to be able to make that more visual. Uh, mm -hmm. Long conversation, that is not really a rapid question. <laughs> yeah, but it I is. Think, yeah, I think this is number one. Giving the fans and the people the ability to follow your favorite doubles player. Yeah. Really difficult to follow someone when you can only watch them when they're playing a big tournament. So yeah, I think this is this is key. Yeah, we're working on it. We're going to try to get it uh, get it on tennis yeah. channel and all the networks more often. Yeah. than it is. Um, awesome, Bruno. So this was a ton of fun. Uh, any final requests uh, of the audience? Well, no, just keep enjoying doubles. I think. Uh, I mean, it's in a amazing game i think uh well it's very nice to be part of this uh podcast because i feel big part of enjoying doubles is understanding what's going on i think yeah. a non-doubles fan uh doesn't really understand mm -hmm. a fast put away volley how difficult it is you know when right. the guy clocks a return and you see a guy like jamie you know, playing an amazing volley out of, you know, extremely <laughs> fast reaction. When yeah. you see it on TV, it looks just a normal volley. When mm -hmm. you know and you understand tennis, you see how tough that, that volley is, how amazing and how much skill you need to have to execute that mm -hmm. shot. So I think a big part of growing doubles is educating the consumer about, you know, how doubles is played and how difficult it is to produce certain shots. So mm -hmm. I think it's very nice to have, you know, someone like you talking about doubles and strategy and all the shots and everything that goes around because I think educating the the fans is a big part of getting them getting them more interest and you know really appreciating how nice certain plays and certain shot is and you know making that way more fun for them to watch. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun to 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 study it. So um, thanks yeah. again, Bruno, for coming on. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, I'll include links to everything in the show notes and talk to you next week. If you're a doubles player, you'll love our weekly strategy newsletter. Every Thursday, I send you my best doubles tips, tactics, and strategies that you can use in your very next match. And when you sign up, 
I'll also send you a free 20-page ebook that has my favorite doubles tactics for forcing errors and getting more easy volleys at the net. Go to thetennistribe.com newsletter to sign up now.